On the far right is Aaron Riley, uh, your far left. Uh, Aaron is, was probably one of the earliest social media people. Uh, Zoe's Room was probably the first kids social media platform ever. Um, she's written a book called Flows of Reading, and her current work is on leveraging engagement, which you're going to see a little preview of this in some of the first public times we've talked about this, but it has attracted an extraordinary amount of attention from our sponsors, um, companies that we've shown it to, and it kind of builds on the work that Henry had done in fan engagement for a long time. And finally, Jeff Long, who is both our technical director and a member of the Research Council as well, as well as Aaron. And um, Jeff was at MIT for many years and then went to Microsoft, where he was the lead narrative producer at Microsoft Studios and probably tried more than almost anybody else to put some of the ideas that Henry had developed around transmedia into practice at a company like Microsoft. So I'm going to just kind of give you a little frame for the work that we're doing. And then each of my colleagues will kind of talk about their individual work. And then we'll kind of do some questions. And then hopefully we'll open it up to the audience for questions as well. Um, I presented some of this, some of these ideas first about a year and a half ago at the Hollywood Internet uh, IT Society uh, Summit. And, and I must say that some of it was met with a fair amount of skepticism, which in the last three weeks obviously turned out, fortunately for me, to be wrong. So um, a little bit about the Innovation Lab. We're sponsored by these companies. Um, the work is all open source, so it's all shared with the companies. And um, I think it's... It's pretty important work, and you'll see why we think this is important. So we start from this point of view, which is that this should be the greatest time in the history of the media and entertainment business, because the global middle class is growing astronomically fast. And when you think that middle class spending in Asia is going from four trillion a year to 34 trillion a year in the next 15 years, that's pretty astonishing. And that same growth is happening in South America and it's happening in Africa. And our research tells us that whenever anybody gets out of poverty and has a little discretionary income, one of the first things they get is one of these, a smartphone. And that connects them up to a global internet. And so this is a chart that our friends at Facebook produce. And obviously it's an amusing chart, but it's a true chart. There will be 5 billion smartphones by the end of 2016 because the replacement cycle for what was called the feature phone, which is being taken away, will be a smartphone. And Chinese manufacturers are selling street-landed smartphones for $35 in Asia and Africa with full Android capabilities. So when you think about five billion people connected to a single network with a single set of standards, HTML, TCP, IP, then the law of large numbers gets really interesting. You could sell something for a dollar, a piece of content, and get 5% market share, and that would be $250 million. So we believe what's happening is that the old gateways the barriers to entertainment that sat under your TV, these two boxes, the set-top box and the DVD player, are going into the dustbin of history. And that that gateway is giving way to a new gateway. And that is that these connected devices will be the control center of all your entertainment experiences. So what do I mean by that? I mean that I will be able to go into a hotel room in three years, pull up my Netflix app on this, the smart TV in the hotel room will recognize this device and will allow me to play whatever I want, whenever I want it, on that device. 
And so that connected world in which connected devices, and by the way, there is no limitation to this right now. All the protocols are in place, all the connections, and at the lab at DirecTV that we're working with, it already works. You can run your TV off your smartphone. So that creates a completely different world. And obviously, a lot of the people that we're thinking about and working with understand that. In the last three weeks, both HBO, ESPN, and last two days ago, CBS, have announced that they were going to do over-the-top applications. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to use TV everywhere, which is a dead standard and will not be useful for anybody. They're going to be able to talk directly to their customers. And that's new. In the history of Hollywood, there's always been a middleman whether it was a theater owner for Louis B. Mayer in the 30s, or a broadcaster in the 50s, or a cable owner in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. There's always been someone in the middle who has all the data and who is the gatekeeper to the customer. These applications like Netflix obviously have shown the ability of people who are putting out content to talk directly to the consumer and know exactly what the consumer wants are life-changing. And for the very first time, we're working with companies that will have data on what people want to see. And the ironic thing is, today, the HBO Go app, which runs through TV anywhere, HBO does has very little data on what people are actually watching on their own app. So that's why they're going around the cable companies. Now, this will, needless to say, disrupt the current TV structure. And when I said this a year ago, people said, well, that'll never happen. And because the, the power of the incumbent was too strong. But obviously, it's not true. And if HBO and ESPN have broken away, then it seems to us the whole notion of the bundle could come undone. However, we think there's one problem with this construct, and it's something that Abig Luton knows very well, which is in the music business last year, 80% of the downloads went to 1% of the content. If you can see down at the bottom of that chart, there's a tiny little green Thing. So out of the 8 million tunes that were available for download, 6 million of them got less than 10 downloads in the course of a year. So that's a problem. And the problem is partially around search engines, which only advantage popularity. Whereas what we think people want is novelty. We want, they want to explore something new. And so partially what we're going to talk about is how maybe you could leverage engagement in understanding who the fans are to do that. So I'm going to stop there and, and I'm going to turn it over to Henry, who's going to talk about what the affordances of a kind of internet centered content world are in terms of spreadable media. Henry. Thanks, John. So most of what I'm going to talk about here is sort of outlined in the book, Spreadable Media, Creating Meaning and Value in a Network Society that I published last year with Sam Ford and Joshua, Joshua Green. But I'm going to bring it up to date with some examples that we've seen emerging since the book was written. In many ways, the book was anticipating changes we've seen over the last two years in even more dramatic, dramatic form. At the heart of the book is an idea that we're shifting from a world of distribution to one where circulation plays ever a more active role. By distribution, I mean the top-down decisions that companies have historically made about which content plays to which audiences under which conditions. So the decision, when do the fall TV shows debut? Whether we show the Avengers at the same time in the US and Europe. Those kinds of decisions are decisions of distribution. Circulation is now a hybrid system. It is still partially shaped, for sure, by those top-down distribution decisions, but it's increasingly also shaped 
by bottom-up grassroots decisions by lots of individuals and lots of networks about where they take the content that's meaningful to them. Some of those decisions are, shall we say, unauthorized. I'm trying to avoid the word piracy because I think it carries such loaded terms that it doesn't allow us to ask some hard questions about where value is created by piracy as well as, well, as, well as where value is lost through piracy. And I think there's stuff we want to think about in a different way in this world. So what I'm calling spreadability is that capacity of content to be taken from one place to the other, to be inserted into conversations, and for those conversations to begin to accrue value and meaning. So the piracy model assumes depreciation, right? That the fans devalue the content they spread from place to place. What we're arguing, I'm arguing, is that there is a kind of appreciation that's also going on. And by appreciation, I mean two things. That fans like it, they make an emotional investment in it, and as they do, do so, they increase its value. They increase its value in a cluttered marketplace by increasing its visibility. So spreadability as a term was set up to contrast, on the one hand, with stickiness, right? Uh, the idea that we build these roach motels, we try to suck people into them and not let them leave, and the longer they stay, the more we monetize their eyeballs. Spreadable is the opposite. That is, if you build content that people take with them wherever they go, it gets inserted into a variety of different conversations. It increases visibility. It increases the relevance of that content to various audiences. So the, part of, the public becomes part of the publicity mechanism for the content. Now, why am I avoiding the word viral, which seems an obvious one on the table? Well, viral implies an, a, a model of infection right, of epidemic infection. And right now, then that doesn't force us to think about the reality is that the public has greater power, authority, and agency over how media flows through our culture than ever before. The companies are anxious about the loss of power. So to describe that as simply you kill, design a killer virus and infects its human host, and like a smallpox infected blanket, they carry it back to the village and infect everyone they know. <laughs> That's not a really helpful way of thinking about all of the decisions we make on a daily basis of all the media that passes through our inbox, which ones, which pieces do we pass along? What do we tweet about? What do we put on Facebook? What do we send to our friends? What messages do we attach to it? How do we attach ourselves to conversations around it? All those choices matter. Now to give you a sense of how they matter, I wanna walk you through a couple of landmark examples over the last five or six years of where, where these processes really kicked in. And the first one, we begin the book with the case of Susan Boyle. Star on Britain's Got Talent, program not designed for the US market, pirated, put on YouTube, sent out. And what's the impact? Well, in September 20, 2009, it was Amazon's best, uh, Susan Boyle's I Dream a Dream is Amazon's best selling album. Nearly three weeks, three months before its scheduled release, it outsold the rest of the top five albums the week of its release combined. Uh, making it the biggest debut by a new artist in a decade. We can think about Psych and Gangnam Style, which follows from that success. I, I and others had long predicted Korean pop culture would be a thing here in the US, because, building off the success of Japanese manga, pop Bollywood films, and so forth. It's part of a growing pop cosmopolitan tendency in our culture, right, of young people seeking diversity around the world. But none of us would have predicted that Gangnam Style would be the first YouTube video to reach one million views, right? Extraordinary numbers that paved the way for other pop artists from Korea to enter the market, or that now, and by May 2014, it would have been viewed two billion times on YouTube. So it used to be grassroots circulation was anticipated to be much smaller scale, more niche, more dispersed than broadcast circulation. Instead, we're starting to see numbers that suggest quite the opposite. We can scale down a little and think about something like Cooney 20, 2012, a 30-minute video about child soldiering in Africa produced by a nonprofit organization here in Southern California. Their in-house prediction was this video would reach about half a million views over a two-month period of time. Instead, it reached over a million views in its first week. So to climb that up next to Hollywood, if you took the highest rated show on American television that week, Modern Family, highest grossing film of Hollywood released that week, Hunger Games, added them together, then doubled them, and then added half again 
as pocket change, you would get the number of people who saw a 30 minute video about child soldiering in Africa, right? That's an extraordinary example of the power of grassroots circulation to increase the visibility of a message. So building off of that, we might think about the ice bucket challenge this past, past summer, right? Which um, didn't reach anywhere near the visibility, no single video on that reached the level of visibility of CUNY 2012. It involved the production of many videos. Altogether, 1.2 million different videos featured the ice bucket challenge in between June, early June and mid August this year. Um, more, the result was more than 739,000 new donors to AL, the, the cause, and which amounted to uh, 41.8 million dollars in donations between July 29th and August 21st, which is double the 19.4 million dollars the association had raised the entire previous year. So again, an extraordinary success story. In this case, not a, a single video traveling, but in fact videos that are reproduced, that are restaged, that encouraged our active participation to increase the visibility of the message. And while that's going on, simultaneously we're seeing via Twitter the, the focus on Ferguson and the challenging the news media's coverage of Ferguson. And again, the numbers are in that case are not that spectacular, but the impact on the way the news media is thinking about racialized violence in the United States is extraordinary. So each of these give us just a snapshot of the beginning of a process by which the public is increasingly shaping what media we pay attention to, what media gets valued economically, who becomes success stories, and what themes and political issues reach the national news media and becomes part of the national conversation. And so I think we have to anticipate a world where circulation is gonna be increasingly driving the decisions of media industries as opposed to being a byproduct or a reaction to those decisions. And I'll turn it over to Aaron. Thank you. So from this notion of understanding circulation and all this, we believe that you can begin to leverage this kind of deep engagement. And so Aaron Riley, our creative director is gonna talk a little bit about that work that she's been doing for the last six, nine months. Sure, so to give you a little background on um, the research we've been doing over the past and year. Tell me when you want to put, me to put the slide up. Okay, I will. Um, um, over the past year, we actually have been developing a leveraging engagement framework based on studying sports fans. More specifically, we've been studying international football fans with uh, not only going down to World Cup and interviewing over 50 plus fans, uh, but we've been collecting uh, big data uh, through, through social media platforms and conducting a global survey in 16 countries um, with uh, 16 countries uh, with over 21,000 respondents. And when we're looking at the work with international uh, football, we find that 14,000 of those 21,000 respondents can tell us a little bit more about their behaviors and motivations and what engages them with that specific uh, fandom, which is soccer. Um, so kind of scoping out a little bit of that um, when thinking about leveraging engagement and kind of building up on uh, what Henry was talking about, we know that audiences definitely have more greater power and agency for spreading media. What our interest is, is really looking at, um, well, what are the motivations and behaviors that have them spread that media? So if you pull up the slide, John. Um, so we're, we're specifically looking at, um, at tons of big data, um, looking across different media platforms and saying that we can no longer segment people into the traditional marketing demographics of young, old, male, female, but really moving beyond just, just um, thinking about psychometrics of who these people are as individuals, but more looking at their behaviors as fan communities. And when you do this, we've identified eight logics of fan engagement in which they uh, there are various ways these fans behave with not only objects of fanship, but also what drives these behaviors. So take, for example, entertainment. Entertainment is one that when we were starting to create this continuum of different ways people engage, entertainment fell 
into every one of them. It's we like to watch. It's that we, no matter what, are enjoying the overall experience, even though there are some questions about anti-fans and how you actually are enjoying that experience. But in one way or another, you're participating. Um, a lot of the connections to the examples that Henry provided have a social connection, that there's this desire to create and deepen a relationship with others. So take, for example, um, the Coney one, the Coney example, or even the a ALS example. You can go to advocacy and play advocacy about championing your uh, your passion, telling people and advocating or defending your position. Identification is another logic in which th there's some personal meaning to you. Or play where you're virtually playing with something, you're remixing it, you're adding it. The Gangnam Style is an example of play, where kids actually then created and danced and developed it and spread it in that way. So these are different behaviors, and there's eight of them. I could go through all of them, but I'm happy to share this information with you. Those are just ex a few examples of the logics in which um, their behaviors are connected to what motivates them to spread this media. Now, when you think about this from um, how do we measure, what are some new measurements and metrics, uh, we've been doing some tests with IBM. And the interesting thing is, is as you start uh, developing definitions and phrases that you see over and over again in social media, including keywords, you can begin to define and find these logics in people's social media interaction. So we're working to develop new metrics of and new met, uh, dashboards of audience engagement that really gets to situational triggers. So we move beyond descriptive analytics or or other people are calling them um, predictive. You know, what, what are people going to do next to more adaptive, you know, adaptive analytics where in real time you understand the situation or context that people are in. So you begin to learn not only their behaviors and what motivates them, but what does the audience know? What does the audience know when they begin to come and participate in the ALS? Some of them don't even know about the nonprofit that actually ran that. And they might use the, notion, the logic of mastery to begin to understand those stories, to begin to understand other people that are involved in it. Um, social is we see that people want to engage with others. They want to connect with one another. And there's different ways of social connection. Um, in our research, we found that not everybody is connecting through social media or one platform. So if you really want to understand social, you need to have this blended experience of understanding people's uh, in-person interactions and connections, which is where wearables could come into play, um, and also their online digital presence. And that influences a per part of it, but influences isn't the final say in how people connect or who the people should follow. Because as we start creating these behaviors and understanding the different logics, you'll find that maybe some of your most uh, um, important communities are really niche, niche, and they're a smaller group that have larger potential for spreadability than just the mainstream audience that's participating because they like to be entertained. They like to watch and socially connect. They might not be personally connected to it in that they identify with it or they're immersed in it where they see the world through that lens. So knowing these different behaviors allows you to start identifying what are the different types of ways to activate these different people instead of providing one shoe, one size fits all, whatever that saying is. Um, you start actually creating multiple different types of campaigns in order to address a larger audience. Now, the most important part of a situational trigger when identifying these different behaviors is context. But context, when you start thinking about it from a big data perspective, can be much more complex than just where people are, which we can do through geolocation, or what time is it, to more thinking about their state of mind as well. What is their mood? Uh, Jonathan Harris years ago, five, six years ago, created this uh, this program called We Feel Fine, and it attracted all the different types of emotions through blogs across the internet. So we can identify these different emotions or psychometrics of people and then connect it to fan behaviors and motivations of a community, of a social community, and together we can begin to leverage engagement to a much more uh, nuanced approach where you can not only find these com specific communities you want to attract, but also what are the objects and, and activations that will help keep them in, in emerged 
or not even those that are already emerged, but those that are maybe more casual connectors, how can you move them on the continuum to further um, provide them value in the ways they like to be motivated or behaved in order to further expand their experience? Great, thanks, Erin. I mean, one of the things we found in the World Cup data was people who engage with football, soccer, for mastery were obviously much better targets for Adidas to sell a shoe than those who engage for social connection. There were a lot of people who wanted to know something about the World Cup just because people were talking about it in their audience, in their office, but they weren't really deep fans. Yeah. And, and, and we think the same thing happens with Game of Thrones. You know, there's some people who, who want to know everything about Game of Thrones and who are masters, kind of like Jeff Long, and, and then there's others who are kind of interested, but it's more social connection so you can have the water cooler conversation. And, and to differentiate those two is important. So I'm going to turn well, it over one, to... One, one more thing really quick, yeah. just to add to that. Um, <clears throat> another interesting thing about it, you know, going to your curation, is when you begin to think about these logics of engagement, there are lots of different user scenarios where we can identify it. So what are some new recommendation engines that are beyond just uh, focusing on popularity to really beginning to introduce them to communities of interest for them? Um, so, th so that... I think, and there's another one, which is, which I think will relate to what Jeff is talking about, about uh, focusing on content creation. If you knew that a, uh, a certain fan community was really interested in sci-fi, but maybe connected to that sci-fi, it's a certain type of dramas or related to it, how can you actually encourage creative teams to use this as a research tool to better understand the fans that they're, they're engaging with? And all this research is related to our partnership with Havana sports and entertainment this is how this came to be and they're there they focus on brands and so we think about this leveraging engagement from a brand uh, campaign strategy of how you can actually in real time uh, change your brand or campaign or digital strategies with the fans to further engage them great Jeff so um, building on this kind of larger conversation that we're having here about the the larger shift um, from what is valued might be from attention to intention. Um, that's kind of at the heart of a lot of the, the bigger shifts that I've been looking at over the course of the last 10 years. Um, the red thread that connects uh, my work is this future of storytelling, kind of along three different uh, ways of thinking about it. Um, if you think about the future of storytelling, I've been looking at, you know, what are the new big worlds? So what I was doing at Microsoft, I first got hired uh, there as part of this future of entertainment think tank, uh, working for Jay Allard and Ray Ozzie, the CTO and CXO of the company uh, back in 2010-ish, um, where I was trying to understand uh, what was at the heart of big worlds like Halo and how big worlds like Halo uh, will uh, populate themselves across all of uh, the entertainment platforms out there, including those that don't exist yet. Um, so what are the things about stories themselves uh, that we will tell each other? What is the future of those stories that we're telling? Um, and, and what is it about them that lend themselves to particular characteristics of, of, of really high level, big world building? Um, the second part is the future storytelling, which is how are those stories told? What are the platforms upon which those are told? And one of the things that we're doing at the lab is looking at the new screens. And so the new screens, we're talking about everything from Oculus Rift, virtual reality products, um, to connected homes, connected cities, uh, to wearables, as, uh, as Aaron uh, waved at a couple of minutes ago. And it's actually interesting. Uh, John, you talked about the phone being the, the, the main part. And I think that in our current environment, you know, what we're going to see over the next 12 years or 12, years, 12 months um, is that the, the phone just becomes the CPU. Like if you think about, you know, five years ago, you know, what you used to have was you know, the CPO under your desk and then a monitor, you know, up on your top of your table and the keyboard out here. Um, what we're going to see is the CPU as the phone in your pocket, uh, potentially a wearable device integrated in our glasses, you know, a little bit cooler than Google Glass um, as the monitor. And then the input unit, uh, instead of a keyboard, you might have something that's a wearable device like the, like the Apple Watch. Um, the thing I found most interesting about last week's announcement from Will I Am about the Pulse smartphone is that he's, uh, smart cuff, I think it was his language, um, was that 
he's demonstrating that maybe not, we may not even need the CPU moving forward. But as long as there's something technological that is on us that we are able to use to identify through the cloud um, who we are and what we have access to, what we have paid to access, um, then that will become unlocked all around us through this uh, completely immersive, ubiquitous computing, ubiquitous screen environment um, that we're moving towards so quickly, including the, the televisions and the hotel rooms. Um, so when we're talking about storytelling, what, how will those story worlds that we're building uh, attach to all of these new screens that are out there in the universe? And then the third part is the future of storytelling, which I think are the people that are going to be telling those stories. And I think about that about um, in our own work, especially with the, the students, right? Um, but how are these people going to make a living? Right? You know, who are these people? What do they need to learn? What are the aesthetics that, uh, that they need to em uh, embrace as they're moving forward? But how do you survive in a post YouTube, post Spotify environment? And a big part of that gets back to what Aaron's talking about, about again, the shift from attention to intention and figuring out how to cater to those particular user types, those uh, you know, uh, audience types, audience profiles, and building worlds that have opportunities for all of them. There was a story in, I think it was Ad Age last week, where we were talking about uh, the end of storytelling, which to a guy like me was you know, highly provocative. Um, but what they were, what they were advocating um, was a shift, uh, especially among marketers, from storytelling to uh, story making, um, where things like the Coca-Cola cans, you know, the, uh, uh, that, the, what, what Coke is moving towards now is not so much telling the story of Coke, but enabling people you know, to tell their own stories uh, themselves through the product, you know, things like the share this with dad. You know, the number of times that I've gotten to share this can with dad as a new parent, um, in the, it just lights me up, right? Mm -hmm. um, or when I get the one that says share this with mom, I'm like, honey, here. Um, and those are little story opportunities for us. Those are little uh, engagement opportunities for us. And you see the exact same thing with vast worlds like uh, uh, World of Warcraft. Uh, where you start building giant worlds with giant rules um, for people to come in through built mythologies, you know, like the stories that are inherent in the first person campaigns to things like World of Warcraft and Halo and so on and so forth. Um, but then also have plenty of room, plenty of negative space, plenty of open areas for people to imagine their own stories, to tell their own stories and with their own friends um, and to build that moving forward. And when we start to figure out how to uh, create a sustainable ecosystem for both the big companies as well as the small storytellers that use these kind of new screens, new business models, new opportunities for collaborative authorship, um, and all of us work together to build these things, I think that's where the next massive generation of uh, the entertainment industry is going to be found. Great. So, I mean, if you ask, okay, why does this really matter? We would say that the one thing that the entertainment industry has never been able to do is price discrimination. So out in the front lobby, I see Mercedes and I see Fords, right? And the Mercedes costs $100,000 and the Fords costs $30,000, right? And you, you willingly pay your $100,000 for Mercedes because it's quality, right? But James Cameron makes a movie for $300 million and sells it for the exact same price as an indie movie that's made for a million dollars. The ticket price, the DVD price, every the download price is the same. Well, that's crazy, right? But that's the way the entertainment business has existed. So I came across something on Amazon a few weeks ago where the Beastie Boys were selling a history of the Beastie Boys. So it was a box set of all their CDs plus a book, which was literally a paperback book about the history of the Beastie Boys. And they were selling it for $160 on Amazon. And I did some research, and they sold 110,000 units of that. Okay, so that's price discrimination. And Why is that? because somebody could figure out who the fan of the Beastie Boys were. And we believe that if you understand the deep fan, the deep fan wants more. The fan on Game of Thrones. This is why, you know, we've been spending a fair amount of time with HBO. This is why HBO wants to do its own over-the-top service. It wants to know who the crazed fan of, of The Wire is or the crazed fan of, of Game of Thrones. And that makes a difference. So... That's why we think this 
this kind of stuff is incredibly important. And when you begin to put out a library like Disney movies anywhere of all your content, your ability to drive people from frozen down the mythical, and it is mythical right now, long tail to Dumbo means a huge amount for your bottom line of Disney. So I'm going to just put well, out. Can I jump in and yeah, respond yeah. a little, John? Yeah. So the, the first point I would make is to think about spreadability in relation to another term I didn't introduce, which is drillability. So we imagine we live in a world where there are more media options than we can ever pay any attention to in our lifetime. Right, just this year, if we watched all the TV shows, all the movies, if we all read all the comics released this year, it would eat more time than we could possibly live. Right, so how do we deal with that plenitude, the loss of scarcity? And one way we deal with it is by relying on our friends to spread messages, to build awareness. And those are short glimpses. But then as we start to identify content that's meaningful to us, the highly rational fan, uh, as opposed to the crazed fan, begins to drill deeper into those franchises and seeks out more information, more encounters with content that's personally, socially meaningful to them by the various axes that Aaron just described. And so we have this relationship between spreadability, which is the mechanism that I'm describing, of circulation, and drillability, which is what opens the way for the social behaviors of fandom, the desire to immerse yourself in these technologies and the kinds of price differential that Jonathan's talking about. Now, Jonathan and I take a slightly different view on the long tail, but I think we end up more or less the same place on everything else, which is to say that the original Chris, uh, Chris Anderson version of the long tail makes a very strong claim for the long tail, which is that the long tail, long in the tail will gradually displace the hits. I think we have to throw that out. I think we have to accept we live in a world, and I think Jonathan's numbers for music, there are variants between film, TV, comics, and so forth, but a, some percentage between one to 10% of the content makes something like 80% of the revenue. The soft version of the long tail is what happens to that other 20%. So if we imagine we round up 10% makes 90% of the revenue, then we're talking about a broader array of works already than were available in most bookstores and record stores before we moved to digital distribution. Where I think spreadability makes a difference is moving content from the hopeless one to two, the, the hopeless stuff that's making one to 2% of the content to that 20%. That's that top 20% is where profit's gonna be made. The stuff further out on the long tail is probably available. It exists because there is probably some fans for it but most of us consume some mainstream content which allows us to engage in conversations with everyone else around us and some highly niche content that is highly personalized but it's the movement between those categories where the mechanics of spreadability and circulation we're talking about makes the biggest difference and that movement between categories is what creates a susan boyle or a psych or an ice bucket challenge or the other kinds of content flows that we we just talked about so henry so, how does how does the transition from what our chairman john Seely brown calls a push universe to a pull universe in other words this movement from a bundled cable system with 500 channels coming at you to an on-demand media system how does this help spreadability drillability stuff like that well, I, I think before we have a pull universe, we have a push-pull universe, yeah. right? And really what spreadability is about is the push-pull, where all, we're all pushers for our friends of content that we are passionate about. And we're all pullers of content that we seek out from someplace else. I have a friend that I met for dinner over the weekend who literally printed out prescription pads so that she can make recommendations of media to other people and other <laughs> oh, people who right. can make media <laughs> recommendations to us. So you write out a script and give it to someone else and say, <laughs> you know, for, because of this, you should watch the show. Uh, and I think that's, we, we don't all literally have prescription pads, but that's what we're doing all the time in a world where there's a lot of rich media, but it's hard to find, is we're recommending to each other media that's useful and interesting to us, we think are relevant to other people. And we're not necessarily writing prescriptions for the same content to our mothers, our mother-in-law, 
as we do to our high school friends, as we do to our children, right? We're making the distinctions about different social relationships, different interests, different tastes. We're making discriminations out of the available media. And that discrimination process is very much part of what we're describing as circulation. It's not one size fits all. It's not gonna likely result in the 1%, the, the top of the long tail. It is more likely to represent that 10 to 20% that is the next layer of the long tail, which is still making money. Uh, and every so often, something will move from that, get more visibility through amplification on news and media coverage, more broadcast, and move all the way to the 1%. But I, I'm, this is not a formula that gets you to the 1%. It's a right. formula that gets you into the profit zone. So, so Aaron, um, Jimmy Iovine and the folks at Beats Music have come to this conclusion that the curator is really critical. So I've got to have Trent Reznor or Dr. Dre tell you what you should be watch. But how does your fan engagement strategy kind of help us let everybody, as Henry was saying, help curate each other's media so choices? I think the curator is important, but I think it's a combination of the man and the machine. It has to be both in order to uh, make the most effective curation. So like when I hear Henry telling the story about his friend with the prescription, I'm sitting here thinking, which of the behaviors is this, is this person um, sharing? And you can definitely see the logic of mastery, where she knows, uh, she knows enough about the media industry to be able to make connections across perhaps different genres or different stories that will make those ties. But other people might not be about mastery. They might be more casual connectors and through social connection of just of not just a friend connecting it, but maybe it's a social connection and pride where I only want to watch things because I'm really into British into the Brits. And so I want to follow the BBC shows and I want to make connections to that and the music and go across different media platforms. So the more we know about the nuanced uh, um, behaviors of an audience, the more we can create value. Uh, in in a specific personalized experience, so it's a it's both. Uh, you, you you know, if we're only doing it from like um, sharing with friends, we're only connecting to a behavior of social connection. And some people are are more engaged in their fanship for other reasons that we need to also kind of address. Yeah, to think about something like Halo, right? Getting back to yeah. the Microsoft universe. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's built in there for the kind of multiplayer, you know, pew pew, you know, get together with your friends, you know, shoot each other in the head, you know, kind of experiences, um, which are very social, right? But then there's also this deep drillable mythology behind it that then caters mastery. to the logic of, made, of mastery, right? Yeah. So you see the exact same thing in things like Star Wars, things like Avengers, even at the level of construction of a single component of that media universe. Um, go, and, go and look at the Avengers movie. You now, there's all these really surface level, you know, funny ha ha jokes, like when uh, Hulk sucker punches the Thor. Uh, sucker bunch of Thor, right? And it's a very surface level uh, level of uh, engagement and humor. Um, but then there's also all these other levels of engagement uh, for back history uh, comic book geeks to, to uh, riff on this. It's a lot like when you think about um, how Aladdin was structured by Disney back in the day, where there's all these surface levels of enjoyment, you know, for a kid like my two year old. But then there's also all these uh, rapid fire jokes um, from Robin Williams. God rest his soul, um, that when you, uh, uh, if you're paying close enough attention and you're of a certain age, you start getting those jokes as well. So it's a multi-tiered, asymmetric uh, kind of experience for all this stuff by catering to multiple models of engagement. Yeah, I think we need to think about um, how we share. So you can look at the open source community and realize that they they figured out by sharing code um, that we create that the whole open source community created a culture where everybody else shared back with you. But they didn't share back code always the same way. You know, there was a lot of different ways that you could skin that cat in order to really realize that nothing was left on the floor. So when we think about spreadability, when we think about the different ways fans engage through different behaviors, you can think about all the different ways we can slice that to spread it, share it, connect with it, whether I'm remixing it and creating it in some way because I have a personal identification to that property, or I'm more of a casual connector where I'm sharing it because I know my friends will be interested in it. So I, I've, I've gone back to this slide because one of the things obviously we want to think about, especially at a conference like this, is okay, what are the new business models going to be like, right? And, and so up here we have a variety of some, like Netflix, are subscription-based. Certainly the new HBO will be subscription-based. 
Some like Hulu are advertising pays. Some are some kind of mix of them. Um, so did anybody have any thoughts about what the kind of business model will be? Will there be one kind of dominant business model in this new on-demand universe or will it be uh, a mix? So, so um, okay, I, I'm totally inspired by Steve Weber's open source business models book on this. And so when I when you shared that question with me, John, I was like, okay, it's not going to just be ad or or subscription based. There's all these other business models that I think will, will are beginning to emerge. And you spoke of one yourself. You know, for that real niche, you know, um, fan that's so focused on it, you can repackage the material and set, sell it at a higher value. And to me, that's more like support sellers where you can package additional services or products with the main product. Um, so for example, take you, you know, you have a, a new Disney movie coming out and you repackage it and kind of upsell with a trip to Disneyland or um, a Disney, a, a Disney character stuffed animal along with it. Yeah. You see a lot of this kind of thinking when we talk about entertainment as a service um, and it's not just uh, uh, entertainment from a channel, but entertainment from a particular IP. So it might be possible to subscribe to something like Star Wars uh, and then get your digital hit of Star Wars every particular week, but it might not always be the same thing, right? So you're seeing this a lot with uh, the, the Marvel Connected Universe. If you could subscribe you know, to the Avengers, came back to that again, um, you might get, uh, on Mondays you get Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., on Tuesdays you get some little um, mobile game, on Wednesdays you get the uh, uh, a new comic book drop, on Thursdays you get um, maybe a 3D printable model you know, that comes out of it, on Fridays you get whichever one of the new 100 comic book movies got announced this last week. Um, and then moving forward, that's the kind of thing I think we're going to have people subscribing more and more to moving forward again, it, which is not so much channel or uh, so much as it is a particular IP or even a particular creator. So that if I could subscribe to everything that Neil Gaiman ever created or everything that Guillermo del Toro created, I would do that in a heartbeat. And I think that that's the kind of ecosystem and business models that we're going to see emerging from uh, independent transmedia creators um, down to the end of the long tail where they can find their thousand true fans um, and by them creating their experiences in such a way that it appeals to as many uh, types of engagement models as possible. Um, or as relevant to their particular mix of demographics or their particular mix of intentions, um, that's where I think we're going to start seeing some sustainable uh, independent creation coming up quickly. But, but let's yeah. not, let's not, let's not actually, and you're going to talk about this, I know, let's not actually take advantage of the fans, right? Mm -hmm. That as we think about business models, we can't just expect that they're going to, um, um, do things for the property or use the IP or remix it and you can go and repurpose it and sell it without them wanting something too. So as we get into this, you know, push pull experience and we know the behaviors and why fans are motivated to participate, we also need to realize that value is not just money, but value is fan participation as well. Yeah, so to so go back to your chart on the, on the slide, I think we are going to see all of these business models thrive, not just in the short term, but the long term. I mean, I think they describe different relationships fans want to have with different kinds of content. Right. And many of us are engaged with those content across those different platforms. Now, what we're going to have trouble seeing is how we differentiate those brands from each other. So as you know, Netflix had an early lead in the production of sort of series. Amazon is catching up quickly between Alpha House and Transparent. We're starting to see original content emerging on Amazon that people are talking about and are going to be committed to, I think, in the same way that they have been to House of Cards and Orange is the New Black. And we're gonna see other players moving into that space. What I think has the most trouble surviving is ABC.com, right? The idea that I, in an age of TiVo, where I scarcely know what channel a program is, it is that my first step is to figure out which network released that content or which production company released that content and then figure out which of those own is Hulu and which of those is on Netflix and which of those has their own sites and which of those, that's not going to work. I think for certain networks, HBO, Disney make clear sense to me as things that in the short term, I will seek out that content because I know what HBO means, I know what AMC means, I know what Disney means. In the same way as a classic movie buff, I know what Warner's 
W Warner Brothers means. I know what MGM means. I know what Paramount means. I know what RKO means. Mm -hmm. But I think for most producers and most networks, the either we find your show based on that brand is like saying we'll organize the record shops back when we had them by the label rather than the artist and see how quickly we can find the Beatles versus the Beastie Boys when we when we're trying to go through the record shop. So right now we we don't have the great the right ways into finding the content we want and whether the future is the curator or the machine. Something's got to step up and do it and I think over time we're going to realize that sort of genres and styles and modes of engagement are going to be better indicators of where we go for what content than brands and at least in terms of production companies and networks. Okay, so I, I want to open it up to the audience in a minute, but I want to ask one last question of my peers here. So, if this, will this new world of on-demand delivered to whatever device you want, wherever you want, whenever you want it, content, lower the barriers to entry for young artists, or will the existing digital oligopolies, which we all know, exists, such as Google, Amazon, Comcast, Facebook, Apple, will they continue to dominate the channels of distribution and promotion? And promotion is maybe just as important as distribution. So anybody have well, a thought we're, on we're gonna, I've been getting ready for an event we're hosting this week with Scott McCloud on the <clears throat> futures of comics and went back and read some of the debate around Scott McCloud's book, Reinventing Comics, which came out a little after in, in 2000. And McLeod predicts there that the web is going to result in an explosion of independent artists who are able to publish their work and find a tr communities around content that doesn't look like superhero comics. And Gary Groth at Comics Journal responded and he said, no, we're going to see the, the major comics publishers play a greater role in the publishing of comics than ever before. So we look 15 years later, more or less. And we have to say both of those claims are true, that there has been an explosion of independent web comics that's brought new generations of artists in that have diversified who is publishing comics, the themes of comics, all of the access of diversity that McLeod talked about in the book has been realized by web comics. And yet we still have to say a higher percentage of DC and Marvel comics are dominating the marketplace than ever before. And DC and Marvel have become even more powerful source forces in our society because of television, film, games, they're the partnership of Marvel to Disney and uh, DC to Time Warner makes that a very more, even more powerful than it was before. So the end of 15 years, it's a draw. I think both of those things have proven to be true. And a third thing is proven to be true, which further complicates it, which is the third largest publisher of comics in the US today is Kickstarter, right? So the crowdsourcing funding of comics is the, the mid space between the independent web comics who sells to their top thousand fans and something that could reach a larger public through the specialty shop and bookshops. What happened to DC and Marvel? Now DC and Marvel don't sell any more books than they did 15 years ago. Despite their growing concentration over the market, the readership of comics continues to go down. What, it's comics content that continues to sell. So if we extract from that, I think the answer to your question is yes. We get more independent artists because they can support themselves. We get stronger concentration by oligopolies because they have all of the competitive advantages. And in between will be something that may be crowdfunded, that may be open source, that may look like some of the experimental stuff that Aaron and Jeff have been talking about. And the one area where this gets a little spooky is, uh, and I hate to raise the specter in the room, but we all, we're all thinking about it, net neutrality. Um, as you start moving towards uh, uh, increasingly large file sizes, right, you know, for, for things like virtual reality, imagine the amount of bandwidth that's going to be required to stream a 4K virtual reality 360 degree environment. Right now, there's only a couple of places on the planet that could probably support, you know, that kind of uh, uh, weight, right? Um, and what is it what will it mean for an independent artist to try and do a really high res you know fully immersive uh, experience five years from now if we start if we're moving towards the kind of uh, environment where only the big studios so to speak you know can support even that kind of file size you know creation uh, distribution uh, and, and delivery rate of speed so that it's 
a really, really sucky, slow, laggy experience, you know, if you are somebody that's a, an independent creator um, versus the fast uh, experience that somebody like Comcast has paid for, does that mean that the virtual reality uh, world that we're moving towards very quickly is just inherently stratified? And does that mean that the indie uh, space there is already being cut off at the knees even before it even get a, gets a chance to start? So I can talk from my own experience of being at the early stages of social media uh, from a young artist perspective. You, you know, what I see now is that all of these people that you named beyond Comcast didn't exist 15 years ago, you know? And so I really believe that innovation will always find a way into the space. Um, but the, pro the, the problem with uh, the new kind of innovations that are coming up is these artists struggle because often they just are being thrown a billion dollars and they're like, hey, you know, I can go start something else. What we need is a lot of them to actually say no to that and be able to live in those middle spaces, how difficult it is, because that's where innovation begins to start emerging problem is, is there's just not structure for it and you see the structure in these agalopolis and they're in it's an easy easy out to be able to address this however net neutrality wouldn't have happened you know netflix wouldn't have existed if we didn't have that and so if we don't really look at the bigger picture of what we need in order for these artists to thrive it could really turn into you know the at&t days right. okay phil Uh, is there any research on the uh, parameters and thresholds of privacy concerns? Can you come up with five or eight points? Is, is there research out there on five or eight points to know how to address concerns so you can reach the data? Right. As, so um, I'm on the on the national board for media literacy. So I really struggle with this question. You know, one side of my brain is going, okay, how do we, how do we actually be able to really begin to really look at audiences in a holistic approach uh, while still protecting or letting them know about data? I think the big thing about privacy is we need to have a national conversation about it and really change you know, no one's looking at terms and conditions or privacy. Everyone says yes to everything. And even if you put it in their face and say, hey, realize I'm collecting this data, three weeks later, they forget about it, right? So there, there are a whole needs to be a whole new process of letting people and being very transparent on, on, on letting people over and over again know that this data is being collected on them. And the, the key is, is, is to educate people on what is the value of actually releasing their data. You know, there's value in that, but if they don't know it, they're just giving up everything rather than being more specific in the data. Do we need everything in regor regards to actually identifying these social communities and what their behaviors are? No, we don't. But, you know, we've been even um, strapped in regards to looking at all the big data because, um, you know, Facebook in our, um, in our survey, 80% uh, of the 21,000 people that interviewed, a majority of them on Facebook, and Facebook is owned by a private company and no one else gets it, right? So you're always gonna be skewed until actually there's some sort of relationship of being able to let those who are on Facebook share it, share, share their data if they want to have a better experience. I think the other, the, the other answer to this question is not to think of your fans as autonomous individuals, but to think of them as part of larger communities. Yeah. And you anonymized. Court the, you court the community and rely on and empower grassroots intermediaries to help spread the word. So the research suggested is for every one hardcore fan of a television show, they may bring as many as 30 other viewers in front of the set to watch that program, who might be family members, who might be people at work, might be social acquaintances of them, that they are actually driving the traffic in such a way that if you court the highly visible segments of the fan community and really give them tools to be the help through the spreadable process that I'm describing earlier, they can do a lot of the work that you need without you focusing so much on the granularity of individuals that it require you to violate their privacy in order to get to that, that same level of penetration. The trick is figuring out how to distinguish idiosyncratic fan communities from larger fan bases. And I think 
the industry as it deals with something like San Diego Comic-Con has faced this paradox and is getting better and better at understanding that that 160,000 hardcore fans at Comic-Con may or may not result, if they buy something, may or may not result in large numbers of people turning in. Yes, if it's Game of Thrones or um, Walking Dead, apparently not if it's Scott Pilgrim versus the world. <laughs> and so figuring out which of why. those it is uh, <laughs> requires, I think, not statistical analysis, but cultural analysis. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of uh, Grant McCracken's Chief Culture Officer book, which argues that in every boardroom, you need someone who really is good at the humanistic analysis of culture to put the numbers you're collecting in a meaningful context so that they can be effectively used. Okay, over there, yeah. How do you make it scale? How to scale? Yeah. Totally. We, we think that discoverability is the biggest problem in this new world. And we're spending half our time on, on trying to figure that out with the help of the IBM Watson team and lots of other people who've got good ideas. And, and as Aaron says, it's not man, it's not machine, it's somewhere in the middle. Okay? Yeah, in the back. Can you speak up really loud because we're yeah. long? Oh, 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 okay. All okay. right. Well, that seemed to be great. Okay, so, great. yeah, go on. Yeah. Um, hi, you guys. Uh, I have a question about the business side of it, the revenue stream, because you have a certain expectation as fast as media reaching a certain quality level. And when you start going into the drill down theory and you have to, you know, these royalties, how do you pay for it? If you're the discoverability factor in order to be able to aggregate, curate enough content to pay to make the quality that you have expectations. And you know, the internet has been free in the past, but now there's all these services, and there's the digital divide folks who can pay and who can't. So, how do you, how does a marketer figure out how to make sure that you use all the platforms in a way that you're going to get enough revenue stream to continue producing quality content? Okay, so I, I would argue quite frankly, that the existing TV universe does not guarantee quality, right? Honey boo boo, uh, you know, I, 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 I need I say more. Okay, so- You're so against honey boo boo. So, uh, so, so the question about that is, uh, we think, at least I think, and I, my colleagues may totally disagree with me, that the existing inner universe is unbelievably inefficient. In other words, you have 470 channels having to produce 24-7, 365 days a year. I would argue that 70% to 80% of that content is watched by nobody. I mean, certainly in the middle of the night or, or and you know, there are lots of TV channels that don't even reach a Nielsen rating. There, there are so few people watching. And, and this happened because at one point, when the digital switchover happened, all these companies like Viacom and Discovery thought it was a land grab. Okay, I'll get, I had one channel, now I have 15 channels. That's what happened with Discovery. Well, look, they grew their audience about 10%, and they dumped 15 times the ad inventory on the market. Well, we all went to Economics 101. That meant that every unit went down, and that's the same thing that's happening online. You know, I mean, Google sells more and more ads every month, but they get less per ad because there's too many damn ads on the internet. Yeah, way in the back.
So if you talk about discoverability, it's like brands matter and the muscle of lead buying has dominated the industry for years. And it's the same on smart TV channels. Actually, it's focusing on doing the promotion on platforms. It sort of works on road, it doesn't work at all on smart TV channels. It's just great for smart TV. So how do you get around that? If you, if you don't have a promo vehicle directed on platforms, you can do the bottom mix of social media. But how do you, once you get the viewer on YouTube, you know, Netflix is not open. You can't buy promotion anywhere. You can't buy it on TV. Um, how does this program work in, in the context of television? You've always had eight years or thereabouts for promos. That's the issue here. It's all about engagement. Is, is there anything here other than social and, and sort of subscription based? Well, I mean, the obvious problem is needless to say that all these services are not indexed in any way by any kind of search engine, right? I mean, you can't you can't go on and say, I want to find, you know, a, an obscure movie from the 40s and see which one of these 10 services that's on. Seems to me that that's a pretty interesting business opportunity for somebody to figure out how to create a discoverability engine for all these online services. Uh, whether that's possible or not, we don't know. What we do know is that even with the branded services that have power, um, they need discoverability internal to their own systems. In other words, Netflix, you know, supposedly great, brilliant algorithm is totally stupid. You know, I, I make a mistake and watch one Adam Sandler movie, and all it wants to do is send me every Adam Sandler movie ever made. You know, that's not novelty. Okay, we're, we're getting the hook here. Um, so I, The key is, is to really think about uh, repackaging, repurposing, redistributing all of this, all of these different channels together into something else. Everyone wants to be their own kind of like kingdom, but maybe the approach for discoverability is to, you know, not be your own kingdom, but come together as kind of a larger community around different genres. Just, just like what Henry was talking about earlier. Right. Right. You know, this need the 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 system. Let's not repeat what we did in the past, just on a new platform. Let's create something new. So, I mean, we're just diving into this world. We encourage all of you to work with us. We really love collaboration, and it's annenberglab.com, and come visit us. Okay, thank you. Thank you.